All right, thank you for watching and by popular demand, today I will present you an overview of the Lebesgue integral, which is really the advanced way of integrating functions. So in calculus, you learned the baby way with the Riemann integral, but in a previous video, I showed that the Riemann integral does have its limitations, but the Lebesgue integral corrects those limitations. And by the way, today I'll just give an overview with no proofs whatsoever. But if you really want the details, this is great channel by Thematica, where he really provides all the details and the nitpicky things. But today is just, you know, an excursion or an invitation to the little trail of the Lebesgue integral. And the way it works is we're gonna start with very basic functions and then build ourselves up until we get the most general function we can think of, which are called integrable functions. So, first of all, for the first four steps or something, assume that f is greater or equal to zero. Assume f is greater or equal to zero, you'll see it's very, it's not too complicated to deal with more general functions. And the, as I said, the way we start, we start with very basic functions, namely indicator functions of some sets. So suppose f looks like this. f only has values one and zero f of x is the indicator function of a of x, which by definition is the function that is 1 when x is in, in that set. So 1 if x is in a, and 0 if x is not in a. As Shakespeare said, to be or not to be. Well, either x is in a or it's not in a. If it is, f you know, says 1. If it's not, f says 0. So it sort of tells you if it's in that set or not. So just for a little picture, suppose our set A looks like that, then the graph of f is as follows. It's 1 if f, x is in A, and it's 0 if x is not in A. All right, and the question is, well, what should be the area under this function? Well, if you think about this, the area in this case is really base times height, but the height is one, of course, but the length is whatever the length of A is. So in this case, if you think about it, the Area under f is just the length of a, or what's called the measure of a. So then, if you integrate f over r, f of x dx, it's defined to be the measure of a. Measure of a. Some people just say integral of 1a equals to measure of a. And what is the measure? Well, I, again, I could spend three more videos on that, but it's really what it is. You know, it measures how big a is. So, um, for example, the measure of the interval 2 comma 5 would be 5 minus 2, which is 3, Right. or the measure how many rational numbers there are, that's very interesting because even though there are infinitely many rational numbers, we can count them. So they're not that many compared to all the real numbers. So strictly speaking, the measure of the rational numbers is zero because rational numbers don't have a length. They're just made up of little points. Whereas, you know, the interval 2 comma 5 does have a length. Okay. And in fact, because 
the rational numbers they have measure zero by the following integral of one q the function which is one on the rational numbers and zero on the irrational ones it has integral zero and in fact i have shown that in a previous video so just to show that the um, definitions are consistent but the thing is though, this is a very, very useful formula because some sets, you have some weird measures, like there's a Cantor set, which I think it does measure zero, but uh, no. there are some non-trivial sets of non-trivial measure, and then this formula helps us integrate the indicator functions of those. Okay, so step one, what is the indicator function? How can we build up more general functions well, let's see for step two. Step two, what is the next step? Well, we started with simple indicator functions. What if you just take combinations of those? What if you add the indicator functions, you multiply them? Well, it turns out it's not too hard to do. So suppose, suppose f of x is just a linear combination of those indicator functions. So if you want sum from one to n of ci indicator function of ai, and by the way, we can, so any such function, if you have such a decomposition, we can make sure that the ai's can be disjoint. So we can split those up. So without loss of generality, Assume the AIs are disjoint. Are disjoint. First of all, those functions, we call them simple functions. Because, well, they are pretty simple, right? They only have a finite number of values. And then, the nice thing is, the integral, you can just define it by linearity, then the integral over r of f of x dx, it's literally just the sum of ci's of those integrals, which is the sum from 1 to n of ci, the measure of ai. It's sort of the next step, and I just want to show you how natural this is. Let's, you know, calculate an explicit integral of this form. Okay. By the way, you can show that this definition is independent of the decomposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Suppose f of x has two values in this case. It's seven on the interval minus one zero union two three and it's four on the interval zero one union four seven sorry i meant to say three values and it's zero on the interval otherwise sorry so just as a graph if that is, for example, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, otherwise it doesn't matter, okay. Then on minus 1, comma 0, the value is 7. On 2, 3, the value is 7. And then on the interval 0, comma 1, the value is 4. On the interval 4, 7, the value is 4. And other than that, the value is 0. No, wait, it's so colorful now. So all the other sets, the value is 0. And then so here it's 0. And then here it's also 0. And then also here. Then we can evaluate the integral, which simply is 7 times the measure of this set 
plus 7 times the measure of this set, plus 4 times the measure of this set, and 4 times the measure of this set. Everything else is 0. So maybe just to say this rigorously, so notice, f is just 7 times the indicator function of this union, minus 1, 0, union 2, 3, plus 4 times the indicator function of 0, 1, union 4, 7. So, by our previous definition, and again, because all those things are disjoint, integral of f would just be 7 times the measure of minus 1, 0, union 2, 3, plus 4 times the measure of 0, 1, union 4, 7. And well, that's equal to 7 times 0 minus minus, 0 minus minus 1, that's 1. 3 minus 2, that's 1. Plus 4 times 1 minus 0, that's 1. Plus 7 minus 4, that's 3. And if you calculate that, you get 14 plus 16, which is 30. So the integral of this function, it's 30. At this point, I just want to remark something, because if you know the definition of the Riemann integral, notice how much it focuses on the domain, like on the x values. Because the way you define the integral, you chop the domain in little rectangles and then calculate areas of rectangles. Here it's a little bit the opposite. Here what you say is, let's just look at the range. And here the range has three values. And let's see at which, where in the x values this, num this, this range is attained. So here we say the function is 7 on this set, the function is 4 on this set, and it's 0 otherwise, and you sort of calculating this integral based on the range values, not on the domain values. So maybe this is the, maybe the clever idea of Lebesgue integrals. And in fact, you know, this sort of leads us to the next definition, step 3. And again, remember, a function is always still greater or equal to 0. Suppose two things. The function is bounded, so it doesn't blow off to infinity. And also, it's 0 after a while. So now consider the set of bounded functions that is 0, is 0 outside a set of finite measure. In other words, it's eventually zero. There's some point, let's say after 9,000 years, where it becomes zero. And same with negative values. So maybe something like that. We have, let's say, a set E. You know, outside which your function is zero. And inside, the function can be anything except it can't blow off to infinity. So maybe it looks like that. So we go it this way. And here comes the important fact. Those, for those kind of functions, you can actually approximate them with our functions from step two. In other words, you can you know, find some sequence of simple functions that get pretty close to this function f. So the picture is somehow like this. You look at the range and you just cut them off at a finite number of values. And then you know, those functions, you can calculate the integral. And then for integral of f, you just take the limit. Let me write that down. So fact we can find, find a sequence of simple functions that 
functions fn such that fn of x goes to f of x, well, not necessarily for all x, but for almost all x. Almost all x. What this means is the x for which this does not hold has measure 0. So it's really for almost all of them. And then how do you define the Lebesgue integral? It's literally as a limit of the integrals of fn. So limit n goes to infinity of the integral of fn dx. And this thing I'd like to remind you from step two. We can calculate, and then to get the integral in step three, you, you know, just take the limit. And you can show that the definition here it doesn't matter which sequence fn we use. There might be many ways of approximating f, but it turns out that they will always give the same answer. Also, if you think about this, for the Riemann integral, it's the same thing. You can think of the fn's as being, you know, like sort of your rectangles when you split the domain up into n pieces then in the Riemann integral, you also take a limit as n goes to infinity. And here it's the same thing, except as I said, instead of doing it for the domain, you're just doing it for the range. And by the way, it's very important that eventually the function is zero, because in general, this doesn't always hold. So if x blows up to infinity, you may not have a global approximation like that. How do you do it for more general functions? So general functions are greater or equal to zero. So suppose you have a function that's not eventually zero and that might blow up. And it's kind of cool, namely, find a function for which this works for step three. Let's say you have some function g that is eventually zero. And then you can calculate the integral of g, so g as in step three. Then your answer is the biggest possible answer you can get by choosing your g. In other words, mathematically, this says integral of f is the supremum, or think the maximum, so sort of maximum, answer you get if you choose a function g such that, that g is as in step three, and g is less than or equal to f. In other words, find the best possible answer you can get by doing, you know, a step three. Now, <laughs> um, it's possible, of course, that this, in, this supremum or this maximum is infinity. And in fact, if the integral of f is infinity, then we say that it's not integrable. So note, if the integral of f in this process is finite, then f is Lebesgue integrable. 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 And if the integral is infinity, then it's not. And here's the amazing thing. The only way here that the function is not integrable is just if its integral is infinity, which means that there's no other way a function cannot be integrable. Whereas for Riemann integrals, 
you could have a function, you know, with a finite, it's bounded, it's finite, but for which the Riemann integral doesn't exist. So the Lebesgue integral always works. Of course, unless you have a function that's called not measurable, where, you know, the, you can't even measure the set where it's one, but that's a different story. But, but so really not Lebesgue integrable, it's just a technicality. If you assume inf infinite integrals are okay, then all your functions are integrable, which is nice. Okay, and last but not least, what if your function is negative? No problem at all. General f. So suppose you have a function that's both positive and negative, something like that. Then notice this function, it's really the you know, difference of two things. There's the positive part. That's f plus. And there's a negative part. That's f minus. f minus. And so notice, in this way, we can write any function, positive or negative, as f plus minus f minus, any f as f equals to f plus minus f minus, where f plus and f minus, they're greater or equal to zero. So I believe f plus is the maximum the maximum of f and 0, and then f minus is the opposite. I guess the maximum of minus f and 0. Yeah, something like that. Minus f and 0. And then the integral of f is just plus this integral minus this integral. So integral of f is integral of f plus minus integral of f minus. So by decomposing a function like that, you can just define the Lebesgue integral in general. Okay, and now you might say, why is this so great? A well, couple of things. First of all, more functions in this way are integrable. In fact, as I said, the only way it cannot be is if the integral is infinity, or if it's not measurable. But, yeah. <laughs> One does not speak of non-measurable functions. And also, there are some amazing convergence theorems with this, because if you've taken analysis, you might say, oh, it's so hard to pass into the integral, right? Pass a limit under the integral. But in measure theory, with this Lebesgue integral, we have this amazing theorem. It's called the dominated convergence theorem. Convergence theorem. For example, if, it says the following, if you have a sequence of functions that converge to your f, so maybe let's suppose this is a function f. And you can somehow approximate it with fn's. Like maybe it looks like that. Da, 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 your fn's look like that. And this is pointwise. So for every x, fn of x goes to f of x. f of x. And We want to say, okay. we want to say that the conclusion is as follows: then integral of f of n goes to integral of f. Okay. Which uh, usually it's impossible, right? But it turns out there's a very easy assumption to check, namely suppose that the fn's, all of them are less than a function g where the integral of g is finite. 
So suppose they're all dominated by the function g and fn of x is less than or equal to g of x, where the integral of g is finite. So under this very easy assumption to check, we can actually pass in the limit under the integral. So it's kind of cool. In other words, limit n goes to infinity of integral of fn equals to the integral of the limit n goes to infinity of fn. Again, you may not appreciate this at this point, but I promise you, once you do more math, this is a very useful theorem. And I forgot to say, well, it has to be greater or equal to zero in this case. But, but yes, so that was my overview of Lubeck integrals. And in fact, in another video, I'll give you a specific example how to calculate the Lubeck integral of a function. And you'll see it's much easier to do than Riemann integrals. So I hope you enjoyed this excursion. And if you want more details, as I said, I highly suggest you to look at Fermatica's videos. But if you like this and you like math in general, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.